24-year-old Gina Allen and her brand new boyfriend, 28-year-old Brandon Day, could not believe their luck. For the past 48 hours, they had been stranded in the rugged wilderness of the San Jacinto mountain range in California when they looked down into this ravine and they saw a campsite. There was a tarp that had been strung up between two trees. And so they ran over to it, hoping that the owner of this campsite would be in there and they could help them get out of these mountains. But when they got to the campsite, there wasn't anyone there. But from the looks of it, it looked like someone had been living in this site fairly recently. Underneath this makeshift roof from this tarp was a sleeping pad, there was a warm sweater, there was shoes, there was a disposable razor, some kitchen utensils, and there was a yellow backpack. Without any hesitation, Brandon and Gina, who were totally famished and they're exhausted and they're desperate, they just start rifling through the different things in camp, hoping to find some things that will help save their life, like a cell phone or a radio or even just a lighter or some matches or some food. And so Brandon focused on all the items that are just kind of laying out under the tarp and Gina focused on the contents of the yellow backpack. And so Gina, she opens up this backpack and she starts pulling out all these maps that are inside. And she notices on the margins of these maps in the white space, there is handwriting and it's done in pen and it looks like it's been written fairly recently. Now, at first, she didn't read any of the notes that were on these margins. She was just kind of pulling them out and stacking them on the ground next to her and continuing to rummage through this bag. But at some point out of the corner of her eye, she noticed on the top map that was sitting on the ground next to her, there was a particular note at the top of the page that as soon as she saw it, she stopped what she was doing, she turned and looked at it. She couldn't believe what she was seeing. And in fact, she didn't want to get her hopes up, but she slowly reached over, she picked the map up and she put it right in front of her face. And as soon as she was reading it, she just started laughing. She was so happy, she was so relieved. She yelled to Brandon to come over and look at this. And so Brandon stopped what he was doing. He turned around and he bent down and he looked exactly where she was looking. And when he read what she had read, he started laughing too. They were saved. There at the top of this map, there was a note that was dated the same date as the day they were there, May 8th. And so they knew whoever had written this had written it at least in the last couple of hours because it was May 8th. And so they had to be around here somewhere. And so Gina and Brandon, they stand up and they start yelling out for the owner of this camp to please come out and help them. But in their excitement, Brandon and Gina had overlooked a critical detail in this note. And it would turn out that critical detail would change their lives and the life of the man who owned this camp forever. Before Brandon and Gina ever began their doomed hike into the San Jacinto mountain range, another man, one which neither of them knew, was gearing up for a hike of his own that would take him through the San Jacinto mountain range. His name was John Donovan, and on April 19th, 2005, which was the day he would begin this journey, he was 59 years old. John had absolutely no family. He was born an only child, and by the time he was 10 years old, he had been orphaned and basically had to raise himself from that point on. Onward. By the time John was in his 20s, he had moved to Virginia, where he had taken a job as a social worker. And despite making a fairly decent salary, he refused to spend any more money than he absolutely had to. It was a habit he had developed as an orphan child trying to make ends meet with virtually no money whatsoever. And as an adult, that habit just never left him. So as a result, for his entire life, all the way up until he left for that hike in 2005, he never had anything nice. He basically wore the exact same outfit virtually every single day. He never owned a car, he never owned a phone, he never owned a computer. And when it came to where he chose to live, he would always live in the most absurdly cheap dwellings possible, which included at one point living in a partially burned down, abandoned savings bank with no heat. John was a proud Irish Catholic. He drank lots of whiskey. He swore like a sailor and he had no problem speaking his mind no matter who he was talking to. While he he was a lovely person once you got to meet him, his unorthodox lifestyle and his at times gruff exterior made it pretty difficult for him to make friends for most of his life. 
But when he was in his 40s, he wanted to lose some weight, and so he decided to join a hiking club. And to his surprise, the other members of this hiking club adored him. They thought he was hysterical, and he made being out on the trail so much more fun and enjoyable. And before long, all these members of this club became John's family that he never had. And so John would go on every single trip this hiking club went on, no matter what. That was the most important thing to him in his life. When it came to hiking, though, John was a bit of an anomaly. Even though he would hike sometimes over 4,000 miles in any given year, he would still routinely get lost on trails he had been on dozens and dozens of times. But despite being totally self-aware of this fatal flaw in his hiking abilities, John rarely did anything to compensate for it. For example, he didn't bring with him on most hikes a compass, which would be the first thing you would think to bring with you to stay oriented. Also, because he refused to buy a phone, he didn't have that to aid him either if he ever got lost. In fact, John rarely brought much of anything on any hike he went on because John is what you would call a ultralight backpacker, which basically meant you would only pack the absolute bare essentials, and in John's case, sometimes less than the absolute bare essentials. And despite his friends trying repeatedly to get him to pack more equipment so he was more prepared, he would always say, no, he knows what he's doing and everything is good. And the truth is, John always did manage to get from point A to point B on all of his hikes, some of which included extremely difficult hikes, like the time he hiked the 500 mile long Colorado Trail, or the time he hiked the 2,175 mile long Appalachian Trail. Now, John would tell you that was all skill, but his friends would say, John was extremely lucky. He would get lost and then at the last second he would find the trail again, or he would lose some piece of critical equipment and then just someone on the trail would happen to walk by that had an extra set of whatever it was that John needed. And then one time when John was in Poland on a hike, he slipped on this icy embankment where earlier that day, two other hikers had slipped and fallen to their deaths. And John has now slipped on this same embankment. He's careening down the sides. He's flailing. He can't stop himself. And then the drawstring on his pants gets caught up in a tree and that arrests his fall and it saves his life. And so from that point on, John would only wear those pants when he went hiking and he called them his lucky pants. In the spring of 2000. And five, John and one of his very close hiking friends named Ken Baker, who was roughly his age, decided they were going to hike the 2,650 mile long Pacific Crest Trail. This trail spanned the entire west coast of the United States. It starts in Southern California, right on the border of Mexico, and it goes all the way up to the very northern end of Washington State, right on the border of Canada. It takes the average hiker, if they're gonna do this entire trail in one go, about five months unless there's bad weather conditions that impede them along the way. John had been excitedly planning this epically long hike for the better part of the last year. He'd actually typed out six pages on his typewriter of this itinerary that planned out every single detail of this hike, down to how many ounces of coffee he would need at every stop along the way. John was especially excited about this particular hike because it was going to be the very first hike he would be doing after his retirement from being a social worker. And apparently John had huge plans for his retirement. He wanted to travel all over the United States. He wanted to go to Australia, to China, to Russia. He basically wanted to hike at least six months a year, every single year, until he was too old or too weak to continue to do so. But just a couple of days before John and Ken were supposed to fly out to California to begin the Pacific Crest Trail, Ken told John that he thought they should actually postpone the start of this trip by about three weeks. He said Southern California had experienced their snowiest winter in decades, and so it would make sense to wait a little bit of extra time to make sure all the snow had melted and that they didn't get caught in any sort of late snowstorm. Now, John was totally not having this. He had spent so much time thinking about this trip. He was so excited about it that he just couldn't wait any longer. And so he told Ken, I'm sorry, I'm going on the current timeline, whether I go alone or not. 
And so on April 19th, 2005, John made his way to his office where he was a social worker. His coworkers threw him a very small retirement party and he literally left the office, went straight to the airport and he flew to Southern California all alone. When he got there, he took a chance and reached out to one of his other hiking friends, a 48 year old tool salesman named Lynn Paget, and asked him, you know, hey, I know you live in the area. Would you be interested in coming on at least part of the Pacific Crest Trail with me? I'm gonna start here in the next couple of days. And John was extremely excited when Lynn said, you know what, sure, I'd love to come along with you. And the two of them made their way over to Campo, California, which is right on the border of Mexico. And they began their hike along the Pacific Crest Trail. But after going only about 100 miles, Lynn's feet started swelling so badly that he could not go any farther. And so from that point onward, John would be alone. The San Jacinto mountain range is the first major mountain range that the northbound Pacific Crest Trail hikers will encounter. And statistically, it's actually the most dangerous portion of the Pacific Crest Trail as 15% of all the fatalities that occur along this huge trail occur in the San Jacinto mountain range. It's a very steep mountain with a rapid rise in elevation from the desert floor all the way up to over 10,000 feet, which means in the summer, even when it's extremely hot down around the base of this mountain, it will probably be windy and snowing at the top. John reached the base of the San Jacinto mountain range on May 2nd, and as he began his slow climb up, all of the hikers he was encountering were all talking about the same thing. There was apparently some big snowstorm that was due to hit the San Jacinto mountain range in the next couple of days. And so all of these hikers were actually evacuating the mountain to go to this little town to wait out the storm. Everyone's fear was they would get caught on Fuller Ridge when the storm hit. Fuller Ridge is towards the top of the San Jacinto mountain range, and it's probably the most dangerous part of the entire mountain range. It's basically this totally exposed, very steep section where if you lose your footing, there's nothing to stop you from tumbling down to your death. But when John heard this, he wasn't phased at all. He was not about to evacuate because of some storm. He was just gonna continue up this mountain, go over Fuller's Ridge, and carry on along the Pacific Crest Trail. And so for the rest of the day, he just continued up the mountain and eventually made camp about halfway up. He actually stopped near two other hikers that were also going to push through despite this storm. It was a 46 year old nurse from Canada named Connie Davis and her son, 20 year old Alex. And they were both very experienced high altitude climbers and they had all the right gear and they were very well prepared. And so that night after both parties had set up their camp, they struck up a friendly conversation during which John made some dismissive comments about Connie's parenting style that really agitated her, although it didn't seem like John really noticed he had upset her. And so needless to say, the next morning, Connie and her son had packed up and were long gone by the time John was waking up. So John just got up, he looked at the sky, it was still clear, although he did see some gray clouds rolling in. So he could sense that yes, a storm really is on the way, but he decided he was still just gonna continue on towards Fuller Ridge. So he put his backpack on and he began walking up the trail. And a little while later, when he was nearing Fuller Ridge, but was still several miles away, three very well-equipped hikers that he had not seen before came charging down the path towards him. And John stopped them and he said, hey, you know, how is it up there? What's the weather like? What's Fuller Ridge like? And they kind of looked at John and sized him up, looking up and down. And they saw that, you know, he's got light clothes on, he's got sneakers on, he doesn't have trekking poles. He just looks totally ill-prepared for what he's walking into. And they said to him, you know, I don't think it's a good idea for you to continue on here. This storm is gonna hit any time now and we're not going to Fuller Ridge. We're actually turning around and leaving because of the storm and we have all the right gear. I mean, you should really consider turning around and leaving. But these three hikers would say there was just no way they were going to change John's mind. He was totally dead set on carrying on to Fuller Ridge. And so the three men that had told him not to go eventually just said, okay, you know, good luck. And they carried on down the trail and John continued up. But despite John's earlier confidence in his plan to go to Fuller Ridge and continue through San Jacinto Mountains, when the snow actually started to fall sometime in the mid afternoon, John started to have doubts about his plans. There was already a lot of snow on the ground where he was from previous snowstorms, and that was making it hard to see the trail as it was. And now with all this additional 
additional snow starting to dump down, he was worried it was going to totally cover up the trail and he would lose it. And since he knew he kind of had a penchant for getting lost on trails, this was a real concern. But he was still very stubborn, and so despite these second thoughts, he just continued on along. And so after a while, he got to within maybe one or two miles of Fuller Ridge when he spotted up ahead of him two other hikers that seemed to be going in that direction. And so he ran up to them and he yelled for them to stop. And at this point, the snow is really starting to come down and the trail is completely wiped out and he can barely see in front of him. And these two hikers, they stop. And so he runs up to them and when he gets up close, he can see it's actually Connie Davis and her son Alex from the night before. And so Connie is obviously not thrilled to see John again, but when he explained that he was having a really hard time staying on the trail and, you know, could he just tag along with them? Connie said, you know what? That's just fine. We're happy to have you. But she explained to him she was not going up to Fuller Ridge. Instead, she was taking a more circuitous route that would bypass the ridge. It would take a lot longer, but it would be safer given the weather conditions. John assured her that that was totally fine. He would just trail along with them. And then at some point he would break off on his own and he would go up to Fuller Ridge and they could go their separate way. And so Connie, her son and John begin walking along together. Now, Connie and Alex, they had crampons on their shoes, which are basically like metal cleats and allow you to very easily grip the snow and ice. They had trekking poles, they had all the right warm gear. And so they're easily moving along through these weather conditions. Meanwhile, John didn't have trekking poles or any high speed equipment. He did have crampons that he tried to put onto his shoes, but because he had sneakers that were not lined up to this type of crampon, they didn't really fit right. And so it caused him to constantly stumble and fall on the ground. And so that's how it went for a while until Connie and Alex reached this critical point. It was at this creek where they needed to go down and around, which would take them away from Fuller Ridge. And if John was going to continue like he said he would up to Fuller Ridge, that would be the point where he would break off from them and go up the mountain towards this ridge. And so Connie and Alex wait at the stream. They're turned around and they're looking back down the trail at John, who's fallen way behind at this point. And as they're looking at him, they're thinking, this is going to take a long time for him to finally catch up to us. And so Connie, who really wasn't all that keen and hanging around John that much longer anyways, she figured, you know what? John has made his intentions completely clear. He said he is going up to Fuller Ridge. He is an adult, he is healthy, he can do whatever he wants. And so she yelled and waved to John and signaled that she and her son were going to go down this creek and this way to Fuller Ridge, so best of luck to you. And then Connie and Alex disappeared around the corner. Once John's hiking partners had gone, John got up to that creek and he was gonna try to go up to Fuller Ridge. But by that point, the snow was practically blinding. And so at this point, John decided, you know what? I do need to turn around and go back down the mountain and evacuate to that town where everybody else had gone to to avoid the storm. And so John turns around and starts trying to backtrack along this trail back down the mountain but the trail is gone. The snow has completely whited it out and there's no other hikers anywhere nearby. And even if there were, he wouldn't be able to see them. And so for several hours, while it was still light out, John did his best to navigate down the mountain. And then when the sun went down, he really had no idea where he was. And so instead of trying to stay on this trail that at this point he really didn't think he was on, he looked out away from the mountain and way down below, he saw this big bright cluster of lights, even through the falling snow, he could clearly see those were lights of a city. And so he decided he would use that as kind of like his North Star, and he would just continuously walk downhill towards those lights. And so for several hours, he just began walking towards these lights, narrowly avoiding huge drop-offs and climbing over boulders and avoiding trees and animals. And finally, he got to this very critical point in his journey down to these lights. He reached this area called Long Valley, where he had a decision to make. He could either continue down the mountain, which would require jumping down into this ravine that once he did, he would not be able to climb back out again. It was too steep. Or he could turn around and hike way back up the mountain and go some other direction. But at this point, he had really no idea what direction was the best direction. All he knew is he needed to go down the mountain because his situation was getting worse and worse by the second. If he didn't find shelter soon, he might get hypothermia and just die out here. And so he decided he would jump down into this ravine. 
And so he laid on his stomach, he lowered himself down over the edge, and he dropped down into the valley below. Once he stood up, he just continued walking down the mountain, and at some point he spotted a stream that he began to follow along. And as he followed this ravine, which was taking him straight down the mountain, he noticed the ravine walls, these huge walls on either side of him, seemed to get closer and closer to him, like this ravine was kind of coming to a point. And then after a while, he noticed up ahead, the stream just kind of disappeared. And so he walked a little bit farther, and then he came to an abrupt stop. The water had disappeared because it had flown off a 100-foot cliff that he was now standing in front of. He had come to the edge of this huge waterfall, and there was absolutely no way to lower himself down over it. It was an absolute fall to the death if he attempted to go down this waterfall. And so he looked to his left, and he looked to his right, and these huge canyon walls that had followed him all the way to this edge from when he dropped down, they were sheer cliffs. There was no way to climb those. And his initial drop into this ravine was unclimbable. He knew that going in. And so he was boxed in, he was trapped, and he likely knew that it would be at least a week or more before anybody figured out that he was even missing. And so totally disheartened, John left the edge of this cliff, this waterfall, and walked back up to a relatively flat area farther up the ravine, and he began to set up camp. He pulled out his green tarp, he put some line between two trees, he made a makeshift roof, he laid out his bed mat underneath, and then he climbed underneath the tarp and he settled in for a long night. The next morning when the sun came up, John attempted to make a fire, but none of the wood he was finding was dry enough. So all of his fires just kind of smoldered, but didn't really catch. He had a mirror, a signal mirror, and he was prepared to flag down any aircraft that flew overhead, but no aircraft did, so he didn't flag anyone down. And so by the end of that night, he was back under his tarp, having made no progress, settling in for another freezing cold, sleepless night. The next morning, when the sun finally came up again, John was totally disheartened, and he decided to start jotting notes down on the margins of his map, which was the only place he had space to write. He figured he would keep a sort of diary, that way, if he didn't get out of here, someone would figure out what happened to him. And so his first entry was that day, May 5th, and he wrote that his friend Ken was writing Right. He should have postponed this trip by three weeks and avoided the bad weather. Ken was the smart one. And also in this May 5th entry, he took an inventory of his food supply. He said he only had 12 cheese crackers left. And then on May 8th, John wrote a note that said, took a fall, too weak to climb out of canyon, down is a gorge, no way out. This was the message that Gina and Brandon discovered when they stumbled on this campsite. But the significance of this note was not literally what he wrote but rather when he wrote it. On May 6th, Brandon Day and his girlfriend, Gina Allen, were in Palm Springs for a business convention. Brandon was a financial advisor, and so he was out here for business, and Gina was his guest, so she was really just vacationing. And so towards the end of the convention, when Brandon had some free time, he and Gina decided to leave the hotel and go on a hike somewhere. And so they actually linked up with a tour group that was leaving the hotel that was heading over to this tram station where they were going to take a tram car all the way up to the top of the San Jacinto mountain range. A tram car is basically like a ski lift, except once you ride it to the top of the mountain, you don't do any skiing, you just do sightseeing. And so Brandon and Gina, they get to this tram car, they hop inside, they get to the top, and it's totally amazing, beautiful view, there's snow at the top, and they're told they have about 20 or 30 minutes before their group is going to take the tram car back down again. And so Brandon and Gina decide to kind of venture off away from the main group and have some alone time before they leave again. And as they kind of venture off, they start to hear what sounds like a waterfall. And so the two of them are kind of looking around asking if they can see it or if they know where it is and they don't. And so they say, hey, do you want to just leave the trail and walk towards this waterfall? It can't be far. It sounds like it's only maybe a couple of minutes away. We'll take some pictures, we'll come back, and then we'll catch the tram back down again. And so they decide this is a great idea. They leave the path and they start walking towards the sound of this waterfall. But after walking for a pretty significant distance, they realize the sound of this waterfall is not getting any closer. 
it seems to actually just be getting farther and farther away. And what they didn't know was happening was the sound of the waterfall was actually echoing off the walls of this mountain. It was basically playing a trick on them. The acoustics made it seem like it was really close, but really it wasn't, it was pretty far away. And so by the time they finally did locate this waterfall, they knew they had ventured fairly far off the main trail and they really needed to hustle to get back up to the tram station to meet their group and catch that last car out. And so they took a couple of pictures of this waterfall and then quickly turned around and began booking it back towards the station. But on their return trip, which they believed they were going in the right direction, they started hearing the sound of voices coming from the tram station, but they were coming from a different direction. And so Gina and Brandon stopped and they're thinking, you know, I think we gotta go this way, but clearly that's the sound of the other people in our group coming from that direction. And so they decide to follow the sound of the voices. But just like the sound of the waterfall, the sound of the voices were not coming from that direction. That was just an echo bouncing off the walls. It was basically a trick the mountain was playing on Brandon and Gina. So they start walking in the wrong direction. And after walking for quite a while and not getting anywhere near the tram station, the voices just finally stop. And they look at their watches and they realize they missed the cutoff. They missed the last tram. All all those tourists they were with, they've left. They are now alone somewhere out in the middle of the mountains. But they did not panic. They figured, you know what? We'll just make our way to the tram station and we'll either catch the next tram or, you know, maybe there's a payphone or something up there we can use and, you know, we'll figure it out. Now, it's important to mention that Brandon and Gina did not expect to spend very much time out in the elements. They expected to get on a tram, stay at the top of this tram station with a bunch of other tourists where there was a restaurant and a bar, and then they were gonna ride that tram car back down and be back at their hotel before dinner time. As such, they didn't bring any supplies. They didn't even have their cell phones. They had left those in the hotel room because they wanted to make sure they were focused on each other. And so all they had were the clothes on their back, which were very light. They had tank tops and some sweatpants on. They each had a very light jacket as well. And they had a wallet and some chapstick. They had no water, they had no food. And so Brandon and Gina, they begin walking around in search of this tram station. And for several hours, despite their best efforts, they don't find it. And then before long, the sun is going down and the temperature is dropping rapidly. And so eventually after it becomes too dark to continue to move around, the couple winds up going into a cave where they huddle up all night, barely avoiding becoming hypothermic. The next day, when the sun comes up, they haven't slept at all, they climb out of their cave, and they continue walking around the mountain in hopes they find this tram station. But eventually, they get to one of the higher points of the area they were in, and they have a pretty good vantage point around them, and when they start looking out, they don't see the tram station, they don't see anything but wilderness in all directions. And so they decided their best bet was just to walk straight down the mountain and try to just walk off the mountain. And they figured as they began walking down the mountain that the tour guide had probably recognized they were short two people the day before. And so certainly a search had been launched and there were people looking for them and probably they would be found long before they ever had to actually walk off this mountain. But little did they know, their tour guide that had brought them onto the tram and then brought that group down, they had recognized they were short two people, but they assumed those two people must have just taken an earlier tram and so nothing was reported nobody was looking for them. And so all day, Brandon and Gina made their way down this very steep mountain, falling half the time, smashing into rocks and trees and getting cut up on manzanita bushes. It was just this awful experience. And by the time the sun was going down, they had no sense of how close they were to the bottom. They didn't have a good viewpoint. They were just kind of trapped inside of the wilderness. And so once again, they huddled up for the entire night. This time they didn't have a cave to protect them from the wind. And so it was just another absolutely miserable night. And so finally the sun comes up on the third day and Brandon and Gina, they're up and they're moving straight down this hill. They wanna get out of there as soon as they can. And after smashing into more boulders and more trees and getting more banged up, they finally arrive at the same drop off down into a ravine in Long Valley that John had gotten to. And so they're standing over this ravine debating whether they should make the leap and jump down into this ravine, even though it means they can't climb out again. And so they're looking around, they're figuring, you know what, we don't really have a better choice. We don't really have the energy to climb all the way up and try to go a different way. And we don't even know if those ways are more advantageous. 
And so just like John, they turn around onto their stomachs, they grip the top of this drop off and then slip down into the ravine. Once they stand back up, they start walking down this ravine and they spot a river and they run over to the river and they drink as much water as they possibly can. And it's a huge morale booster. And then they get back up again and they're continuing walking down the stream when off in the distance, they notice a green tarp strung up between trees. It was John's campsite. And so Brandon and Gina, they run over to this campsite and they eventually come across John's notes on the margins of his maps. But after standing up and yelling out for this owner to please come out here and help us, we need your help, we're lost. And then no one came out of the woods, no one heard them, no one responded. Brandon went back to the note and he looked at it again and that's when he noticed it. The note had been written on May 8th. However, it had been written on May 8th, 2005. The year that Brandon and Gina were reading it was 2006. So this note was one year old. John had just happened to get lost and write a note on the exact same calendar day that Gina and Brandon arrived at his campsite and discovered the note. In their initial excitement and joy that they might get saved, they did not pick up on that year discrepancy. The couple began looking more closely at all of the gear underneath the tarp, and they noticed all of the metal objects, like the forks and spoons and the pots and the pans, they were all starting to rust, and some of the other objects, like the shoes, looked like they had been sitting in the same spot for a really long time. They both started to get a really bad feeling about this campsite, like something terrible had happened there. Gina emptied the yellow backpack's contents onto the ground, and that's when they found a wallet. They opened it up and they pulled out an ID card, and it was John Donovan's ID card. So now they knew who had written the note and who owned this camp. Afterwards, Gina and Brandon laid out all of the maps to see if there were other messages that they had not read yet. And there were, there were two other additional messages after the May 8th message. On May 11th, John said he was celebrating his 60th birthday and that unfortunately he was down to his last two cheese crackers. And then in his final message on May 14th, John wrote, headed down to Creek for water, goodbye, love you all. Devastated, the couple knew what they were reading were almost certainly John's last words and his body was most likely somewhere around here. And then it dawned on the couple that if John, who seemed like an experienced hiker who had all this gear, if he had gotten trapped and died out here, then how did they stand any chance with no experience and no equipment? And so not knowing what else to do, Gina just rounded up all of John's things. She stuffed them into his yellow backpack and then she shouldered the pack. And then she and Brandon just walked away from John's campsite and continued walking downhill, hoping that up ahead, there was not going to be some gorge like John had mentioned in his May 8th note. But unfortunately, after walking for a little while, they reached that cliff with the 100 foot drop with the waterfall going off the side of it, and they realized that they were trapped, same as John. There was nothing they could do. And so totally speechless and shocked, they just both sat down, they didn't look at each other, and they just sat there wondering what was gonna happen next. And they both were thinking, you know, this could be the place where I die. At some point, Gina kind of snapped out of her trance and she took John's backpack and she began rifling through it, pulling everything out all over again. And Brandon asked her, you know, what are you doing? And she said, well, you know, maybe there's something in here that we missed. Maybe there's a secret pocket or, or something in here that could help us. And so she rifles through this bag and sure enough, she finds inside of a small pocket in the bottom of the bag was another bag, a little plastic bag, and inside of it were matches and they were still dry. And so immediately the couple pull them out and they start to round up logs to try to make a fire. And as soon as they light it, it doesn't catch because all the logs in the area that were on the ground were wet from previous snowstorms and rainstorms. And so all night they tried lighting these fires, but they all just kind of smoldered out. And so eventually after the sun went down, Gina and Brandon, who were totally disheartened, they went back up to John's campsite and they went under his tarp and they huddled together for another freezing cold night. The next morning, Brandon woke up because he actually did fall asleep and Gina was still sleeping. And so Brandon decided to just leave the tarp and go out and get a breath of fresh air. He knew they were in a terrible position, but he just wanted to clear his head. So he stood up and he could barely stand. He was so achy and tired and he was so hungry and he decided he would just walk down to the edge of this cliff and look out into the valley to see if maybe there was a way down. And so he walked along the river, stopping periodically to get a sip of water until he got to the very edge 
And when he got there, he looked down and he saw something that he had not seen the day before. There in a pool of water all the way down, a hundred feet down, was a body lying face down in a pool of water. And that body belonged to John Donovan. Brandon was too far away to actually confirm if that really was John, but he instantly knew. But instead of being scared or saddened or depressed by the sight, it kind of invigorated Brandon and reminded him that if he doesn't act, he and Gina were going to die too. And so Brandon decided he wasn't gonna set some small campfire to try to signal someone. He was gonna try to light the entire forest on fire. And so he walked back up to the campsite and he got the matches out from the backpack and then he walked into the forest a ways that was right near the river and near their campsite and he found this tree that was obviously dead and he walked around gathering as much dry wood as he could and he propped it up against this dead tree and then he put as much kindling as he possibly could into this hole in the trunk of this dead tree and after doing all this prep work he got his matches out and he lit some of the kindling and to his surprise the tree caught on fire almost immediately in fact, it burned so quickly and so big that Brandon had to run away so that he didn't catch on fire. And before long, all these trees are catching on fire and he had to run all the way back to the campsite and wake Gina up. And so he grabs Gina, they get up and they run all the way over to the edge of the waterfall and they turn and they're just watching half an acre just completely erupt in flames. And all this black smoke is billowing up into the sky. And then about an hour later, after the fire had eventually just kind of died out on its own, Gina and Brandon heard the distant rumblings of a helicopter. They had seen the smoke and they were coming to rescue them. Gina and Brandon would be airlifted out of the ravine and would make full recoveries. John Donovan's body would be recovered three weeks later. His cause of death could not be determined. Some say that final note he left on May 14th, where he said he was going down to the creek to get water and then said, goodbye, I love you all, that that was sort of a suicide note, that he actually threw himself off that cliff to end his suffering. Others say he just walked down to the edge of this waterfall and was trying to get a drink of water from the creek when he slipped and then fell over the edge to his death but we'll never know for sure. What we do know for sure is that in 2005, when John Donovan was still alive and missing, had he been rescued, he would have left the valley with all of his supplies, including those matches, which would have meant in 2006, when Brandon and Gina found themselves in that ravine, there wouldn't have been a way to start that fire, and so they would have died. In fact, the helicopter pilot that did come up and rescue Brandon and Gina, he would say there was nobody planning to search that area. This was not an area they believed Brandon and Gina would be. And so it really was only because of that fire that those two lived. As such, the couple said they owe their lives entirely to John Donovan and his unbelievable sacrifice. On July 11th, 2006, a funeral was held for John in Virginia. 80 people showed up for it. Most of them were his hiking friends from his club. After the service was over, they all kind of poured out onto the cemetery lawn around John's gravesite. And as the bagpipes played Amazing Grace, Lynn Paget, the man who had done the first 100 miles of the Pacific Crest Trail with John, John before his feet swelled up and he had to leave, he walked around the crowd handing out red solo cups filled with a tiny bit of John's favorite whiskey. And then after making sure all of the adults had their drinks, Lynn went to the head of his very good friend's grave and he delivered a beautiful eulogy. In it, he tells the crowd that he thinks of John all the time, he misses him terribly, and at night he has the same dream. He's walking down this trail next to a stream and then the stream bends off to the side and as soon as he walks walks around the bend, he sees this green tarp and he knows it's going to be John. And so he yells, hey, comrade, hey, comrade. And as he's walking over to the tarp, he realizes John isn't there. All it is is a tarp, a pack, and some shoes on a rock. As for Brandon and Gina, they did stay a couple after the ordeal, but they would ultimately break up two years later. If you got something out of today's video and you haven't done this already, please sneak into the like button's house and warm up both sides of their pillow before they go to sleep. Just after midnight on June 17th, 1939, a crowd of people began to form outside of this unremarkable building in Versailles, which is a city in France. The atmosphere in this crowd was electric. 
They all knew why they were there. They knew what they were about to see, but even still, there was a lot of nervous anticipation. And so as such, some people were coping with these nerves by drinking alcohol and trying to laugh and have a good time, while others were much more subdued and were trying to be respectful about what they were about to witness. Between 1 and 2 a.m., the doors of this unremarkable building opened up and a group of men dressed in the same dark uniforms came out and didn't say a word to the crowd and the crowd immediately went silent and began to back away from them and this group of men they walked right out in front of this building and they had lumber and they had tools with them and they began constructing this kind of strange wooden structure and so the crowd they wanted to get up close to see what these guys were doing but at the same time they didn't want to get too close and so as the crowd formed a sort of half moon around these men these men that were doing the constructing were moving so seamlessly like all of them had built this structure dozens of times before and it was just muscle memory and so by about 3 a.m this structure was built and they placed this large basket next to the structure and then these men packed up their tools and the remaining pieces of lumber and they turned around and they went right back inside the doors into the building and were gone at this point the crowd had become quite sizable outside of this building and they were growing kind of restless because they knew now that this structure was built that the next time those doors open, the show is really going to start. The spectacle they are all there for, it's about to happen. And the crowd all knew that this event couldn't happen if the sun was up. Because if the sun was up and the area was well lit, the press would be able to take pictures and film it. And that's not what officials wanted. They wanted this to happen in the darkness. But for whatever reason, things seemed to be getting delayed inside of this building. And so the crowd was just getting more and more restless. People are getting more and more drunk and they're getting louder and more disruptive and boisterous. And then around 4.45 a.m., the sun had come up. And so the press was out in full force with their cameras trained at the doors of this building. And so the crowd really at this point is not actually expecting this event to take place because at this point, it just seems totally unlikely. But at 4.50 a.m., those doors swung open and standing in the threshold was 31-year-old Eugene Weidman, who was a convicted serial killer. His arms were tied behind his back and the collar of his white shirt had been tucked down inside because they needed his neck to be free and clear because he was about to be beheaded. So the two guards on either side of Eugene, they pulled him forward out towards the crowd so the executioners behind him, who were dressed all in black, could filter out and take up positions alongside the guillotine, which is that wooden structure that had been built earlier in the morning. And so as Eugene is being brought out towards the crowd and everything is getting set up for his execution, the crowd went wild. They were shrieking and howling and laughing and pointing and booing and just generally being completely rambunctious and totally bloodthirsty. Eugene kept his head down. He did not want to look at the crowd and he did not want to look at the guillotine. And so eventually the two guards turned him and walked him directly towards the base of the guillotine, at which point the executioners that had taken up their positions around this device, they grabbed him and slid him forward so he was on his stomach on top of this wooden platform, the guillotine, and they slid him forward until his head poked through this opening at the very far end, at which point his neck was positioned right under this huge blade that was dangling right above him and his head was positioned over a metal bucket on the ground which he would be looking directly at. At this point the crowd was at a fever pitch and one of the executioners pulled a lever, the blade came soaring down and it removed his head, his head fell into the bin and the executioners pushed his torso into the basket that had been placed out there earlier and then the executioners and the prison guards they gathered up Eugene's body parts and went right back inside of the building which was a prison. At this point the crowd was cheering and going wild and they ran up and began dabbing their scarves and their handkerchiefs in Eugene's blood, which was on the ground, as a sort of souvenir from having been at this execution. And of course, because the sun had been out for this entire spectacle, all of this had been captured on film. And so later that day and for the next couple of days, the headlines all over France were about this bloodthirsty crowd that was cheering as this man was beheaded. And it just overall made France look really, really bad. And so French leaders decided that from that point forward they could no longer do any more public executions. So the guillotine would continue to get used for decades beyond this point, but it was all behind closed doors. Also, 
random fact about being beheaded by a guillotine, your head, after it's been separated from your body, stays conscious for about 10 to 12 seconds, so they say. And apparently there's been lots of cases where the executioner, after the condemned has had their head removed, will yell the name of the person who has just had their head removed, and that person's head will look over at the person calling to them and will blink or try to mouth words for several seconds before the lack of oxygen kills the brain and then the head is no longer conscious. Here are some of the more notable pictures that were used in the media from Eugene Weidman's execution. In the early 1900s, Eben Byers was a man who other people envied. He was born into a very wealthy family in New York City. He attended Yale University in Connecticut, which is a very prestigious Ivy League university, and he was devilishly handsome. After his college graduation, he didn't need a job because his family was so rich, and so instead he focused his time on a passion of his, which was golfing. And in time, he became this world-class golfer, going so far as to win the 1906 U.S. Amateur Tournament, which is the biggest amateur golf tournament in the world that most of the winners go on to become professional golfers. And so Eben most likely would have followed that path and become a pro golfer had his father not just handed over over the very successful metalworking business that he started that made his family wealthy in the first place. And so Eben stopped his golf career and became the chairman of this incredibly successful company. And so overnight, he basically went from being just rich to being uber rich, making more money than he could possibly spend. But Eben did attempt to spend his money. He pretty much immediately began buying up luxury properties all over the country. He bought horse racing stables in the United Kingdom and in America, and he bought an entire luxury box at Forbes Field, which is where the Pittsburgh Pirates professional baseball team used to play. And so in addition to owning all these incredible things, Eben also, through his role as chairman of this company, began connecting with and befriending very powerful and influential people like the founder founders and executives at the Coca-Cola company. And so all in all, Eben's life was really going quite well until 1927. That year, Eben was 47 years old, and he took some time off from gallivanting around the world and rubbing shoulders with famous people to go catch a football game at his alma mater at Yale University. So he hops on a train, he rides to Connecticut, he watches this game, and then afterwards, he gets back on the train to head back to Pittsburgh, and this is a very long ride. It's over 12 hours long, and so Eben naturally bought a first-class ticket, and so he was inside of a train car that had bunk beds for passengers to sleep on during the ride. And so Eben climbed into a top bunk and he fell asleep. A few hours later, after the train is well on its way to Pittsburgh, Eben, in his sleep, manages to roll to the side of the bed and actually falls out of his bed onto the ground. He lands hard on his left side, it wakes him up, and as he stands up, he thinks he's okay, but then he feels this shooting pain in his left arm. So he's moving his arm around, he's not really sure what's wrong with it, but he's hoping it's just some bruising, and so he decides to get back into his bunk and just go back to sleep. And so he manages to fall asleep despite the pain, and then when they roll into the station in Pittsburgh several hours later, he wakes up and right away he feels Feels that pain in his left arm. And so after getting off the train and going back to his house and dropping off his luggage, he went right to his physical therapist's office to ask him if there was anything he could do to help with the pain in his arm. And so the physical therapist examines Evan's shoulder and determines that, you know, there's no structural damage to his arm, but obviously Evan is in pain. And so he says, look, you know, there's a new product that came online that's quite expensive, but since you're a man of means, maybe it's something you want to consider. It's called Radithor, and it's supposed to dull aches and pains and it's supposed to give you this huge boost of energy and so you know maybe you want to try that and so Evan was really excited at the notion of taking this new health tonic and said, yeah, let's do it. And so his physical therapist wrote him a prescription for Radithor. Evan took the prescription and he went to the drugstore. He picked up a half ounce bottle of this liquid. He went back to his house and as prescribed, he drank a very small spoonful of this liquid. 
and right away he felt the surge of energy, the pain in his arm started to fade, all the things this health tonic claimed to be able to do, it was doing. And so over the next couple of days, Eben very diligently every day took the prescribed amount, a very small spoonful of this Radithor, and every day he felt better and better and better. Not just the pain in his arm, but overall he felt happier, he felt fitter, he felt alive, and he was attributing all those feelings to this miracle tonic. And so he began taking more and more of this tonic, well beyond what was prescribed, to the point where he was drinking three full bottles of Radithor every single day. And so for years he did this, and it was all going great until his jaw fell off. Literally, in 1931, one day, his lower jaw just separated from his skull and went slack. And so the reason this happened was because Radithor was actually just radioactive water. In the early 1900s, the radioactive element, radium, was believed to have highly curative properties with no side effects. And so naturally, at the time, dozens of health products were created with radium being their main ingredient. And Radithor was one of those products. It was literally just water and radium. And so after consuming over 1,400 bottles of Radithor over a three-year period, Eben's body was finally just starting to disintegrate from the inside out. After he had his jaw surgically removed, along with large portions of his upper jaw, the rest of his body also just began to crumble. And so by the end of 1931, when his story was making headlines all around the world about the dangers of Radithor, and really more specifically, the dangers of radium, Eben had become completely bedridden and his skull was now beginning to disintegrate. There were holes forming all over his skull that were exposing portions of his brain. And so by 1932, Eben was dead. Eben was buried in Pittsburgh and he was buried inside of a lead-lined coffin that was designed to absorb any of the radiation emitting from his bones. And then 30 years after he was buried, so in 1965, scientists actually exhumed his skeleton to see if it was still emitting radiation. And they determined it was still emitting the same levels of radiation as when he died. And they actually would ultimately figure out that radium, this radioactive element, has a half-life of 1,600 years. So what that means is Eben's body will remain highly radioactive for centuries. Here is a picture of Eben with his jaw surgically removed. It was taken shortly before he passed away. There is still some debate about what exactly happened in this story that I'm about to share with you. And so for transparency, in this video, I am going to rely on the narrative that was presented in court by the defendant. And so with that in mind, here we go. On the afternoon of December 3rd, 2012, a freelance photographer working for the New York Post newspaper named Umar Abbasi was walking down the stairs of the 49th Street subway station in New York City. This very busy station is located only a few blocks away from the very famous Times Square. And so after Umar made his way down to this underground subway station, he walked over to one of the big automated kiosks that looks like an ATM and he purchased a subway ticket. And then with his ticket, he walked walked over to the turnstiles, he slid his ticket through the slot, pushed past the turnstiles, and was now standing out on the actual train platform. And from where Umar was standing, this platform basically was like a huge sidewalk that stretched all the way to his right a couple hundred feet and all the way to his left a couple hundred feet. And in front of this platform were the actual tracks down below, because the train, when it came out of the tunnel, it would actually come right up alongside this platform with almost no clearance between the platform and the train. As such, the leading edge of the platform, basically the lip of the train platform that's closest to the train tracks, has this big yellow line painted all across it to keep commuters from standing too close to the edge because if the train came through, they could actually get hit by the train. And so as Umar is standing on this platform and he's looking left and right, it's totally crowded with people and they're all kind of tucked back against the wall away from this yellow line. And so Umar decides he's going to turn right and wait at the right end of the platform, just because he saw it down at the far end, there appeared to be 
see a gap in people and he figured he could stand right there. And so Umar begins navigating past all of these people on the right side of the platform and for the most part everyone he is passing either has their head buried in their phone or they're listening to music or both because the thing about riding trains especially trains in busy cities is nobody none of the commuters want to talk to anybody else they want to be completely left alone and so as Umar is walking everyone was basically doing that but at some point he did pass two people that were engaged in a pretty heated conversation Umar had no idea what they were arguing about or if they were even arguing at all he didn't know who these people were but he took mental note of the fact that two men were kind of bickering with each other and so he walked past them didn't give it much of a second thought and he arrived at a gap in the gaggle of people waiting for the train and there he just stood well back of the yellow line where he pulled out his camera and began clicking through the images he had taken earlier in the day at an earlier photo shoot and so as he's clicking through these pictures he starts to notice that those two men who had been bickering before are now straight up yelling at each other they're screaming obscenities at each other it's not clear who's fighting about what or who was the aggressor but it's very obvious obvious that at this point they're fighting. And so Umar looked away from his camera and looked left down the platform towards these two guys. And so these two guys are about 100 to 125 feet away from him. And all the people that were standing in the vicinity of these two men are beginning to migrate away from them. They just don't want anything to do with them. Because the thing about being in subways, especially in cities like New York, is there's lots of people that go down into these train stations that are inebriated or mentally unstable. And so very strange and bad bad behavior is just kind of a normal thing and people tend to just kind of ignore it. And so that's what's happening. People are kind of walking away from these two fighting men doing their best to pretend it's not happening. And so Umar spent a couple more seconds staring down the platform at these two men, but eventually just shrugged and thought, you know what, whatever problems they have, they're not mine. And so Umar went back to his camera and continued to click through his pictures when all of a sudden he hears a scream coming from the left side of the platform. But it was not a scream that sounded like it came from either of these two men. And so Umar looked up from his camera and looked left down the platform and now he just sees chaos. It's people running away from these two men. People are running to get away from whatever is happening around them. And so Umar's thinking these men must have come to blows and they're now fighting actively physically with each other. But when finally the crowd kind of cleared for a second he saw a woman pointing down at the train tracks right in front of where those two men had been standing. And so Umar looks at the woman and he follows her finger down onto the tracks and he sees there is now a man, one of the two men who had been fighting, laying face down on the train tracks. And then, to Umar's horror, he looks up down the tunnel where the train would come out of and he sees the headlights of the train. It is now coming into the station. And so Umar starts running down the platform to try to get to this man to pull him out of the tracks. And as he's running, he pulls out his camera and he turns the flash on and he holds the shutter down and he aims it at the train conductor to hope the flashing of his camera will alert the train conductor to put on the emergency brake and stop the train before he hits this guy down on the tracks. And so as as Umar is running, trying to signal this train conductor, the man down on the tracks tries to stand up and Umar sees he's really struggling to stand. And when he finally gets up, he turns and he grabs the edge of the platform and he tries to pull himself up and out of the tracks, but he doesn't have the strength or the coordination. And as Umar is getting closer and closer, but he's still too far away to help, he sees that this guy down on the tracks is not gonna be able to get out of there before the train hits him. And so Umar finally comes to a stop and he watches as this man down on the tracks lets go of the lip of this platform and just turns and faces the train like he knows what's about to happen. And then seconds later, the train, although it did try to stop, impacted this man and killed him instantly. The man's name was Kai Sakan and he was 58 years old. When the police finally showed up, they arrested the other man who Han had been fighting with. He was a 30-year-old named Naeem Davis, and Davis would actually tell police that he had been fighting with Han, and he had pushed him onto the tracks, but it was in self-defense. However, that self-defense story didn't stop him from being charged with murder. While Davis sat in jail waiting for his trial, the media and the public at large had already come to the conclusion that Davis was guilty. And this was due in large part to a particular picture. As Umar was running down the platform, holding up his camera, holding the flash down, trying to flag the train conductor to get him to stop, Umar was also taking dozens and dozens of pictures. And those pictures were of Han right before he was struck by the train. And so after Umar ultimately discovered he had taken these
these pictures. He gave them to his employer, the New York Post newspaper, and the day after the incident, they ran on the front page a picture of Han right before he's about to be killed with the headline, Doomed. And so once the public saw this picture, nobody could believe that Davis was anything other than a cold-blooded killer for pushing this poor, innocent man onto the tracks. But as it would turn out, nearly five years later, when Davis did finally get his trial, he was acquitted of all charges because it turned out Han was very drunk and had picked a fight with Davis and Davis was filmed on more than one occasion on the platform trying to get Han to leave him alone. And so finally, after Han began making death threats and then grabbed Davis's shoulder, Davis turned around and pushed him and Han, being drunk, stumbled and fell backwards onto the tracks and then was ultimately killed. Here is the infamous photo of Han on the cover of the New York Post newspaper. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please become a surgeon and get a job at the hospital located nearest to where the like button lives. And then eventually when the like button goes in for a very minor outpatient surgery, accidentally give them a craniectomy. On Monday, May 23rd, 2005, 37-year-old John Wilson got home from a very long day at work and immediately just collapsed into a sofa. John was an oil pipeline inspector in Houston, Texas, and that day it had been extremely hot and he'd been driving around all these different job sites and he'd been out in the sun and he really hadn't had a break. And so now that he was home, he was totally exhausted and knew he should probably just go to bed but he didn't want to. He didn't want to just go right to bed and then have to get back up again and go right back to work. He wanted to unwind before calling it a night. And so he decided what he would do to unwind would be to go fishing, something he really loved to do. Normally, John did a lot of freshwater fishing, but tonight he decided he would do some saltwater fishing. And so at about 7.30 p.m. that night, he grabbed his fishing rod and his tackle box, he threw it in the back of his pickup truck, and then he hit the road. About an hour and a half later, he had driven all the way south to the very coast of Texas to a beach called Crystal Beach, which is right on the Gulf of Mexico. And instead of parking in one of the parking spaces in the lot, John, like he always did, just drove right through the gate out onto the actual beach. This beach actually had a reputation for having really hard packed sand, almost like cement, because so many people like John would drive their vehicles out onto the beach. And so he goes through the gate and he drives straight out towards the water. And although it wasn't completely low tide yet, it was making its way towards low tide. And so there was a lot of beach exposed. And so John drove for quite a while and then he parked still in the tidal zone but well away from the water. John probably figured that he would not be there long enough for it to matter because high tide was not for several hours. And so John hops out of his truck, he preps his fishing rod, and he walks out into the actual surf and he begins to fish. And it would have been very, very peaceful as there was not really anyone else down there as it was pretty much the middle of the night. There might have been a couple other fishermen nearby, but that was about it. And for a while, John probably just enjoyed the peace and quiet. He enjoyed fishing. And then after a while, John got overwhelmingly tired. Maybe it was from all the work earlier in the day out in the sun that was just finally catching up to him, or maybe it was all the moving around in the surf, getting knocked around by the water that was making him tired, or maybe it was both. But either way, John decided he wanted to take a nap before he headed home again. And so he left the surf zone, he dropped his fishing rod in the back of his truck, and then he crawled underneath his truck to take a nap. The following morning, a man who was out for a walk near Crystal Beach looked out into the water and he saw a truck was half submerged in the surf zone. And so he called the police and then the police called a tow truck and then the tow truck driver showed up to the beach and when he got there, it was still relatively high tide. And so he had to wait until it was low tide enough that he could actually attach the chains and start pulling this truck out of the surf zone. And so finally, when it was low tide enough, the tow truck driver walked down and as soon as he was standing next to this partially submerged vehicle, he saw there was a body poking out from underneath it. And that body belonged to John Wilson. No one knows for sure what happened to John after he climbed underneath his truck. 
but the best guess is after he went under there, he fell asleep and he slept for longer than he anticipated. And in that time frame, even though the sand of this beach had this reputation for being really, really hard, well, after a couple of hours, his truck would have begun to sink in the sand. It would have settled into the sand. And so John, as he's laying there at some point, would have been trapped by the underside of his truck. And then from that point, either the truck just continued to settle, ultimately crushing John to death, or it kept him pinned there, but he was still alive. And then the tide came in and eventually he drowned. Either way, John's final moments must have been torture. Sevnica is a gorgeous town right in the heart of Slovenia, situated right along the Sava River, which is one of the longest rivers in Europe. The section of the Sava that flows past Sevnica was a popular destination for kayakers and canoeists up until 2008, when a hydroelectric dam was built across it, creating a sort of dead end for anyone trying to go through that section of the river. They would have to stop at the dam, get out, walk around, and then pick up the river on the other side, or that would mark the end of their trip that day. In 2008, while this dam was still under construction, the mayor of Sevnica, who was in favor of the construction of this dam, he understood that this was kind of a bummer for the people in town. While the dam itself was going to provide more electricity for the town, it did kind of end an era. And so he decided he would organize a final trip down the Sava River past the dam while they could still go right past it. And he was calling this trip the final descent. And so he went all around town asking people if they wanted to come and he finally recruited 27 other people to come with him on this final trip. And so a few weeks later, on July 3rd, after all preparations were made, the mayor and the rest of his crew, they made their way upstream to this loading area where four canoes have been set out for them. And the staff people that had actually provided these canoes, they offered the group life jackets. And virtually everyone in the group turned it down. It's unclear why they turned down the life jackets, but one could guess that, you know, the river itself was incredibly calm and they were not expecting to be on the water for very long. And so they just decided they didn't need one. And so after all 28 people got into their canoes, seven people per canoe, they pushed off the shore and they began their slow trip down the river. And the mayor had actually hired a photographer to come along with them to document their journey. So as soon as they take off, the photographer is looking around, taking pictures and filming. The weather was beautiful and the water was calm and everything was just going really, really well. But about 15 or 20 minutes into their journey, they turned this corner and they got a clear view of the dam, which was about a thousand feet away from them at the time. Now, the dam was not done yet, but it was pretty close to being done. And so the actual structure of the dam, it was built. And so even from a thousand feet away, it was very obvious to tell that up ahead, there's these big cement archways where the water flows down over this dam. And the whole group pretty much immediately saw they had a problem. The plan, according to the mayor, had been they would get to this dam, but on the left side of the dam, there was going to be a strip of waterway that had not been blocked off yet. Because when this dam was complete, it would completely obstruct the river side to side. But because it wasn't actually done yet, the construction crew had told the mayor that, yep, the left side, there's gonna be an area where you can basically just casually go right past. You won't go down the dam, it's totally safe. But here this group is on the water looking at the dam and even from a thousand feet away, it was obvious there was no side way to get around the dam. You clearly had to go through the dam or you had to get out and go around the dam. Now the river was moving very, very slowly. There wasn't a strong current. And so there wasn't some urgent decision that needed to be made about what they were going to do. The group intuitively knew that the right choice here is to you know, go to the side, get out of your canoes and either go around or just end the trip right there. But the mayor and a few of the other people in the other canoes got the idea that, hey, why don't we just go over the dam? I know we're not supposed to, and the construction crew explicitly said, don't go over the dam, it's extremely dangerous. But from the looks of it, it didn't look that bad. And truthfully, it did not look too bad. This was not some enormous dam with some huge drop off. It was actually a pretty small dam where the water kind of went down this fairly small embankment. that was maybe 10 or 15 feet long. And at the bottom of this embankment was some semi rough water. But overall, it just looked like it might be kind of fun to go down this dam, like you'd be going down a slide with your canoe. And so the mayor was really keen on doing that. 
this. He made it seem like it was gonna be fun, it was gonna be an adventure. So before long, three of the four canoes were fully on board with the idea of just going over the dam. The fourth canoe that was not prepared to go over the dam had the photographer in it. And they said, you know, we're not comfortable with this, but we'll pull up next to the dam and we'll just film you guys going over the dam. It'll be really cool. And so after making their plans about who was gonna do what, the four canoes continued down the river. And when they got about maybe one or 200 feet away from the entrance to this dam, the fourth canoe with the photographer pulled off on the left side of the river, they got out and the photographer lifted up his camera and he began filming the other three canoes as they made their approach into the dam. Now, the video from this photographer that was released to the public, it shows the first of these three canoes actually going into the dam. And you see these seven people on this canoe, they're kind of happy and excited looking. They have nervous anticipation, like they're about to start a roller coaster or something. And they're making their way into this dark section inside of the dam. They're basically going through the gates of the dam where they're going to go down this embankment and as they go into the darkness as you begin to lose sight of them you see the back end of the canoe suddenly pops up because now they're going down the actual dam itself they start sliding down and then you hear someone in the canoe start to scream and then it goes completely silent and then the video just ends. That canoe, right after it slid down that downslope, it would reach the waters below, but the canoe would capsize, throwing everyone on board into the water. And these seven people, they didn't even have a chance to catch their breath before they were sucked under. Not only because the water was rough at the bottom of the dam and kind of was churning and pulling them under, but also because this is a hydroelectric dam. And at the bottom of the dam, underneath the water where they were, were all these big openings to underwater tunnels. And these tunnels functioned like vacuums. It pulled water down inside and then ran the water past a turbine, causing it to spin, and that would generate the electricity. That's what the dam actually did. And so after the water was pushed past this turbine, it would be jettisoned out somewhere else downstream. Now, even though this dam was not fully operational yet, these tunnels and the turbines at the bottom of them, they were operational. So as these seven people are dumped into these incredibly dangerous waters and they're getting pulled down towards these tunnels, the other two canoes, they have no idea what's going on with this first canoe. And so they just continue on and they go over the dam. The second canoe that went down the dam, they also capsized at the bottom. All seven occupants were thrown out and they were sucked down underwater almost immediately. The third canoe that went over the dam, they did not capsize. And so after they cleared the dam and kind of paddled away, they began looking around for the other two canoes that should have already been down there. And there was nobody out in front of them. And so they turned around thinking maybe they're closer to the dam and they don't see anyone, but they see one of the canoes is completely flipped over and the other canoe has been broken apart in the churning waters right at the base of the dam. And they see the wood from this canoe just getting tumbled around. And so this third canoe, immediately turns and tries to paddle over to the base of this dam to try to start pulling people out of the water. But when they get over there, there's no one there. The 14 people that had been in these two canoes they're gone. Ultimately, 13 of the 14 people that fell in the water that day would perish, and one of the fatalities was the mayor. The only person who survived who fell in the water was actually the mayor's wife, who by some miracle managed to swim out of the grasp of these tunnels under the water and made it to shore. Over the next several days and weeks, police divers were able to eventually find all 13 bodies, one of which had traveled 25 miles away to Croatia. No information was given about the state of the bodies when they were found. And so we don't know if having been sucked down through these tunnels and forced past these underwater turbines played a role in their death. All the public knows is that all or most of these 13 people were sucked down into these tunnels and then they died. Full transparency, this next story was pretty difficult to put together because the details of what actually happened to the victim are just really difficult to decipher. And so I think I've been very thorough and I've done a good job describing what happened, but I'm willing to accept it if I'm not right and this is actually inaccurate. And if you think I am, feel free to let me know in the comments. With that said, 
Here we go. In 1974, 18-year-old Debbie Stone landed what she considered to be an amazing summer job. She was hired to work at Disneyland in Anaheim, California. Her specific role was to be a hostess at a brand new attraction called America Sings. Disney had basically converted an old carousel, which is a ride that spins around in a circle, they had converted it into a rotating stage. And they put up partition walls all along this rotating stage to create six distinct stages on this rotating stage. And so on each of these six stages were different sets of these robotic animals that played different songs about America. And so the way this would work if you were in the audience is you would walk into this theater that looked like a single theater with one stage right in front of you. But really what you were looking at is one of the six stages. And so the audience would sit down, they would see one of the acts, they'd see one performance on one of the stages, and then the stage would rotate. And so the audience would remain in the theater until all six stages had rotated in front of them and played their two to four minute long act. Debbie's job at America Sings was at the beginning of these shows where the audience would watch all six acts, she would go up before the very first act, she'd go on stage and she would greet the audience. And then the show would start, it would filter through all six of the stages, and then Debbie would get back on stage and she would say goodbye to that group of audience members. It was a simple gig and Debbie seemed to like it. And so on July 9th of that year, which was nine days after this attraction had opened, and so it was nine days after Debbie had started her job, Debbie was asked to come in for an evening shift. And so she left her house and she made it out to the attraction at about 10 p.m., which was right at the start of a show. And so she went right inside, she hopped on stage, she greeted the audience, and then she left the stage and the show began. And so over the next 30 minutes, all six of the stages performed their acts. And then after the sixth act was done, Debbie dutifully climbed back onto the stage. She said goodbye to the audience. And then as that audience was leaving the theater, she turned around and walked towards the back of the stage she was on. What happened next requires some additional explanation. Each of the six stages that made up this attraction had a fairly tall back wall. And behind each of these six back walls that were kind of in a ring was the center of the actual attraction. And in the center was this circular, fairly tall storage room. This storage room did not rotate, it was stationary. The stages and their respective back walls, they rotated around this storage room. The gap between the outside of the storage room at any point around it and the inside of the back of the back wall was maybe a couple of inches, it was pretty narrow, but it was big enough that a person in theory could get stuck back there. So it was a real hazard. However, Disney did not put any specific safeguards in place to prevent their staff from intentionally or unintentionally going into this space. They just told their staff to not go back there and be careful. So back on July 9th, after Debbie has said goodbye to the audience and she's walked towards the back of the stage she's on, she decides to move from the stage she's on to the adjoining stage. And when she does that, she either trips or falls or something happens, which causes her to fall into the narrow space between the two back walls of the two stages she was on. And so she falls through that gap and then gets wedged between the outside of the storage room and the back of one of the back walls. She tries to pull herself up and pull herself out of the space, but she realizes she's stuck. And so she starts to panic and she starts screaming for help. None of the staff hear her or they don't recognize that this is a real call for help. And this new wave of people that are coming in, the new audience, they're all talking loudly. There's music playing. They don't really hear her. And anyone that actually did hear her calling for help, they would later say they thought it was part of the show. And so as Debbie is screaming bloody murder, she cannot get out of this gap, this narrow gap she's stuck in. These stages, they start to move because the show is gonna start. And because Debbie has nowhere to go, when the stage began to rotate, she got forcibly dragged and twisted and rolled and her body began to contort and bones started to break and she was forced to continue moving through this narrow space because the stage was just gonna keep on going until it reached its next position. And so finally, after it dragged her all the way to its next position, 
Debbie didn't die. She was grievously injured. She probably had dozens of broken bones, but she was alive and she's still totally stuck and she's screaming with every ounce of energy she has. But again, the audience, even though they heard her screaming, they assumed it was part of the show. And apparently the staff also heard her screams and convinced themselves it was just no big deal. And so two to four minutes later, when the act was complete, the stage began to rotate again. And so Debbie again is rolled and contorted and crushed and dragged and smashed and broken as the stage again rotates to its next position. And she's still not dead. She's screaming out for help. No one is coming to help her. And so the entire show would play out with the stage rotating through all of its sections. And then finally, at the end of the show, when one of the audience members alerted the staff that, hey, you should really go check out that screaming we heard. And at that point, they went for a look and they discovered Debbie and she was very obviously deceased. Disney would pay a small settlement to Debbie's family, and then they would put up a number of safeguards on the America Sings attraction to make sure something like this never happened again. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, at the like button's next birthday party, please gift them a three-year supply of Radathor.